Therapy Chat Podcast, episode 351. This is the Therapy Chat Podcast with Laura Reagan, LCSWC. The information shared in this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health professional. And now, here's your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. This week's episode is sponsored by Therapy Notes, the number one rated electronic health record system available today. With live telephone support seven days a week, it's clear why Therapy Notes is rated 4.9 out of 5 stars on Trustpilot and has a 5-star rating on Google. Therapy Notes makes billing, scheduling, note-taking, and telehealth incredibly easy. And now, for all you prescribers out there... Therapy Notes is proudly introducing ePrescribe. Use coupon code CHAT or click the link in the show notes to get two free months at therapynotes.com. Are you tired of running to the lobby to see if your next appointment has arrived? Would you like a more discreet, stress-free way for your clients to check in? Take a deep breath. The Receptionist for iPad empowers your practice to create a zen-like check-in experience. This episode is sponsored by The Receptionist for iPad. It's the highest-rated digital check-in software for therapy offices and behavioral health clinics used by thousands of practitioners across the country. Start a 14-day free trial of The Receptionist for iPad by going to thereceptionist.com slash therapy chat. And when you do, you'll also get your first month free when you sign up. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Chat. I'm your host, Laura Reagan. And today I am so excited to speak with my guest, Dr. Galit Atlas. We talked about her newest book, Emotional Inheritance, and the way that family secrets, unspoken experiences, intergenerational trauma is carried forward. It's more than simply our DNA, which isn't simple at all, but it's it's in our unconscious and our psyche. And as Dr. Atlas is a psychoanalyst, she she talks about this in a very interesting way. So my guest today is Dr. Galit Atlas, who's a psychoanalyst and clinical supervisor in private practice in New York City. She's on the faculty of the New York University postdoctoral program in psychotherapy and psychoanalysis. And she has published three books for clinicians and numerous articles and book chapters. Her New York Times publication, A Tale of Two Twins, was the winner of a two 2016 Gradiva Award. A leader in the field of relational psychoanalysis, Dr. Atlas is a recipient of the Andre Francois Award and the NADTA Research Award. She teaches and lectures throughout the United States and internationally, and her book has been translated into at least 17 languages since it was released in January 2022. And we had a very intimate conversation. And for me, it was interesting and enlightening and thought provoking. And I know that it will be for you too. So let's dive right in. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Chat. I'm your host, Laura Reagan. And today I'm so excited to be speaking with Dr. Galit Atlas. Galit, thank you so much for being my guest on Therapy Chat today. Thank you, Laura, for inviting me. I'm I'm really excited to be with you today. I'm so excited too. And I I'm dying to talk with you about your book, Emotional Inheritance, A Therapist, Her Patients, and the Legacy of Trauma, which is so interesting. But before we get into it, let's just start off by you telling our audience a little more about who you are and what you do. So I'm a psychoanalyst and I'm a faculty member at the NYU postdoctoral program for psychotherapy and psychoanalysis. This is actually my fourth book, my fourth publication, but it is my first book for that is not for clinicians. Mm-hmm. And my, my f- first three publications were books for clinicians. And this is my first book for the public, uh, published by Little Brown. And uh, it is a really, and we, we'll talk about the book, uh, but this book is, is, um, is also for therapists, of course. It's a book about therapy, and it's a book about emotional inheritance and what we clinicians often call intergenerational transmission of trauma and intergenerational transmission of emotions from, uh, of course, from one generation to the next. Yeah. And, you know, I think that the conversation or mm, the cultural discourse, at least in my world, 
in the U.S. and trauma field. What I hear being discussed about intergenerational trauma, it often, there's kind of two camps. There's like the scientific, what's happening in the genetics, Mm -hmm. and then there's the emotional inheritance, which is more intangible because it's not, you know, it's not DNA. It's something that is just present. Right. That, that's a really, really good point. And I think that's where uh, the book is right there, you know, in that gap, because I do mention epigenetics and the research and, and but then also the intermingling of uh, nature and nurture. Yeah. And I think what you're pointing at is important because if when we think about in the you know, the nurture part of it, we actually never developed a language that people that are not clinicians can understand, and and maybe even clinicians, about what are we actually talking about when we talk about intergenerational transmission? How did that even happen? And, you know, even when we talk about unconscious communication and those those things that, that when I speak for the public, right, to the public, people look at me like, what are you talking about? And what is that about? And what do you mean by that? And when you talk to clinicians, I think it's very hard even for us to explain what unconscious communication means and how it works. And so we can, I think that's where the book started. It started with a few questions. What does it mean? How does it work? And how does it look? Right? Because all of those are big words, right? And like intergenerational transmission. Okay, but wow, what does that really mean? Right? How, how, does, how does it look in the, in the office? Exactly. And, you know, and as when I first learned about intergenerational transmission of trauma, it was sort of hearing about it as an idea of parents doing what was done to them. So like, behavioral, you know, like modeling what, what you learned, but it's, that's, that's one aspect of it maybe, but that's not really what we're talking about here. Right. Right. Exactly. This is, it is one aspect, but it's not what we're talking about here because what we're talking about is not what was done to us that is transmitted from what was done to our parents. It is more about how we hold our parents and, and grandparents inside us. How did, how did they live inside us, in what way their experiences, without them necessarily even telling us about those experiences, live inside us? How do they shape our lives? And those stories almost touch the the unbelievable sometimes, right? Those are, right. Right? Those are the stories that, that we are left a little, a little speechless was like, how did that happen? How did I know without knowing, of course, and without anybody telling me that something that happened to my grandmother is right, is impacting my life? How, how did that happen? And there are many, many examples of that in the book and many ways to, to explain really what happens to us in that process and how, and how, how do we live and how does the intergenerational unconscious works? Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yes, you're really mm-hmm. piquing my curiosity a lot here. So I guess I want to ask you before, I, want, I would love for you to explain those three points that you mentioned. And, and I think before even asking you to explain that, can you talk about what made you write this? Because it's partly, you know, your story is part of this too. Right. And so, you know, in the book, I say that every research is me search. <laughs> yes. And this book was definitely my me search. But interestingly enough, it didn't start as my me search. It developed and at least not consciously. I, I'm, I assume that the me search is there unconsciously always, even before we know that we're searching for something. And, you know, when I, when I supervise um, students or supervise their dissertation, I always say, like, look for the me search. Look for what really touches you emotionally and you don't even necessarily know about it yet. And so for me, intellectually, I would say, It started with the understanding that when I sit with a patient, I sit with more than the patient, but with a few more generations that sitting with us in the room, I sit with their parents and with their grandparents. And again, 
the understanding is that it's not just, of course, I work with object relations and, and I'm a relational analyst and I'm thinking about the relationship and the, the, early, the early object relationship and attachment and all of those things that many of us work with. But here, I think I added a, a different angle to thinking about in what way your parents and grandparents that sit in a room with us actually shaped you, right? Who they are, not what they did shaped you. And so intellectually, I think that was an understanding. I wrote a few pieces for the New York Times. And one of the, I think the first one was 2015 or 14 that dealt with those issues. And then I stopped and asked myself, what am I really dealing with here emotionally myself? And that was a time in my life where my life partner was very ill and had cancer. And later on, he passed away. And I think that my own grief and my own, my own trauma, I would say, brought me right into the heart of how, how we live trauma, how we transmit trauma, right? And how we process trauma. Yes. I'm very sorry for your loss. Thank you. Well, thank you for sharing that. And yeah, it's, it's so the unconscious. It's so unconscious. (laughs) (laughs) Right. (laughs) But it's like, it's taking up so much space in our lives, whether we see it or not, you know? Yeah. And it's, and the truth is that it impacts our lives, right? It's, it actually, everything we don't know and everything that is unconscious has the power to control our lives. And and I think that's what we uh, therapists actually work against and with both. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's one of the reasons that this interested me so much is, you know, there's, there's so much that the client can't tell you because they're not consciously aware of it. And there's so much that goes on between the therapist and the client that's unconscious. And I know, you know, we talk about transference and countertransference. And again, the way I learned, which is not psychodynamic or psychoanalytic was, you know, those are like problems that you need to mm. not, not allow to interfere with yeah. you doing therapy work rather than that's some material that's part of the process. Right. Yeah, you know, those are very uh, old school psychoanalytic, right, yeah. concepts that the the transference or the countertransference, especially the countertransference is something that you need to block and work, with, you know, and, and make sure that it doesn't interfere. Same yeah. with enactment, you know, we used to think that enactment is only a way, something that in, interferes with whatever is happening. And I think that we are now, I mean, of course, contemporary psychoanalysis and contemporary clinical work in general, we already know that we work with countertransference. We work with enactment. You know, Lou Aaron and I, when we wrote a dramatic dialogue, our, our book for clinicians, we really emphasized the generative use of enactment and generative enactments and in what way enactments are inevitable. And how do we how do we look at it and not just resolve it and get, you know, fix it or in exactly in the same way that you were talking about countertransference, we get to the point where we where we actually work with it and understand that it's inevitable. That's what the the title of the book was dramatic dialogue, understanding right contemporary clinical practice, understanding that the dramatic dialogue is there in every therapy in with every patient to do right in this way or another. Yes, exactly. Well, thank you. And I'll be sure to link to that book in the show notes. And in addition to, of course, the book that we're talking about now, you know, emotional inheritance is, is, is a slightly different book. It's not. It's not an academic book. Mm-hmm. Uh, my my previous books were academic with all the references and the academic jargon, right? Emotional inheritance. What I hear from clinicians is that after they read it, they recommend it to their patients, and I understand it because um, I I didn't I never recommended it to my patients, but but of course I think that there is something about when when you work in with the concept of intergenerational, you're not sitting there and teaching your patients what intergenerational transmission means, 
But there, it's such a relief sometimes to have somebody else's book, right? And say, you know what? Read this and you will, you will understand what we're talking about. So I don't need to explain to you the concept or the history or, the, or how it looks really. Uh, yeah. So I think, I think that is um, the shared thing between therapists and their clients as opposed to, you know, those clinical academic books that our patients would really, really suffer reading. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Wading through a lot of yeah. parentheses and long yeah. references and stuff. A lot of references, <laughs> a lot yeah. of like history, a lot yeah. of where this term came from and how do we think about it, right? Exactly. No, your book is very readable. It's engrossing. I mean, I didn't read it all yet, but as I'm going through it, I'm like, oh, just sucked in and then, you know, not having enough time to finish it all yet. But um, not that it's not, you know, I think that it, I could read it fast if I just had the time to sit down because I was caught right into it. People tell me that they read it in 24 hours. And I think that the, the paradoxical thing about the book is that the read, I think, is easy. The content is not always easy, you know. The content is about, of course, trauma, uh, ghosts, all of those secrets and ghosts that were held, right? The book is divided to three parts. So the first part, it's generational. It's our grandparents, our parents, and ourselves, right? So with our grandparents, it's mainly focused on intergenerational transmission and how the third generation holds the grandparents, the grandparents' trauma, And again, some of those traumas are traumas that they knew about, and some of them are traumas that they had never knew about and yet hold them. The second part of our parents is is really about, I I think the first chapter is called When when Secrets Become Ghosts. And it is about all of those secrets that live between parents and children, all of those things that our parents never told us and sometimes didn't even tell themselves, right? Right. Sometimes those things that are completely dissociated, t- taken away out of the family narrative, there is a chapter on unwelcome babies, these unwelcome pregnancies, accidental pregnancies, and uh, there, there is, you know, death in the family that the parents did not want to burden the children with and, and just didn't tell them and how that lives in the child's unconscious and all of those uh, secrets and and the third part is called secrets we keep we keep from ourselves and much of it of it is about how we and it's about the next generation how we what we transmit but how do we actually it's about dissociation and repression and all of those and again I'm I'm telling you this because I know the, your audience is mainly therapists but I hardly use those words you know I hardly use jargon in the book I hardly I use theory here and there but really hardly speak about I explain concepts but I don't use them as if you, everybody knows what that means but that's why I call it secrets we keep from ourselves how our mind actually helps us protect ourselves from knowing and how in that way we collude with previous generations and all, and all of those through are through stories, right? Stories of people and how that looks very experienced sneer, because the truth is that what I love the most is the, the clinical work and sitting with another person. And, right? and as yeah. you said before, right, when we spoke, like that amazing experience of, of living with another person. Yeah. And it feels like magic sometimes and mysterious and mysterious. Yeah. Running a group private practice has been a challenging and rewarding experience. And one thing that has made it so much easier is therapy notes. Therapy notes makes billing, scheduling, note taking, and telehealth incredibly easy. If you're coming from another EHR, like I did, Therapy Notes makes the transition incredibly easy, importing your demographic data free of charge so you can get going right away. My team has found Therapy Notes very easy to learn. It's intuitive. The customer support is second to none. 
And that's one of the things that has kept me a Therapy Notes customer for several years now. Anytime I've needed to contact Therapy Notes for help with an issue I couldn't figure out on my own, I've been able to get through to someone and resolve the issue within 15 minutes, 99% of the time. Find out what more than 100,000 mental health professionals already know. Try Therapy Notes for two months absolutely free. Just click on the link in the show notes or enter the promo code chat at therapynotes.com. Therapist, has this ever happened to you? You're sitting with a client in the thick of a therapy session, fully focused on the important work that's happening between you and the client. Suddenly, 30 minutes into the session, from down the hall, you hear the door to your office suite open. You and your current client were the only people in the suite, but now someone has come in. You're distracted from your current client as your anxiety shoots through the roof. Is it your new client who's scheduled to meet with you in 30 minutes? But your current session has 20 more minutes to go and you don't want to interrupt this client's process to go check on who's there. Are they wandering through the suite looking for a receptionist? Is it a delivery person here to drop off a package that needs a signature? Are they about to come knocking on the therapy room door? Is it your neighbor from across the hall dropping off a piece of your mail that was left at their address? You hear the door close. Did they leave? This has happened to me so many times over the years. As I anxiously anticipated the session with the new client, I would worry they were feeling anxious or abandoned because they weren't greeted when they got to the office. Now you don't have to worry, and your clients can relax too, knowing that you have a discreet, stress-free way for them to check in when they arrive for their appointment. The receptionist for iPad is a simple, inexpensive way to allow your clients to discreetly check in, to notify providers of a patient's arrival, and to ensure your front lobby is stress-free. The software sends an immediate notification to the therapist when a client checks in and can even ask if any patient information has changed since their last visit. Start a 14-day free trial of The Receptionist for iPad by going to thereceptionist.com slash therapy chat. And when you do, you'll also get your first month free when you sign up. So can you can you explain a little bit about that you know, what you said before about those three points about intergenerational trauma, like really what, what does it mean to you for the context of this book? You mean about how we, what, how, how it looks and what it's, yeah. I think I want to start maybe with how it happens. Okay. Right. Because how it looks, I think anybody who reads the book, there are 12 chapters and in every chapter there is a different angle and a different story that shows you something unique and specific about how that could look. Okay. Right. And how it is. But I think the most pressing question that I hear again and again is really, so how, how, how do you transmit emotions from generation to generation? Yes. And how does that, you talk about epigenetics and about the genetics that we understand there is a research. You could look at it. You understand that the, you know, there's change in the expression of genes and the next generation inherit that. And, and okay, that you can look at the data. It's, it's, uh, it's much more clear. Yeah. The way I, I talk about it in the book is that we inherit emotions and and traumas it, through the attachment the, the main basic unit right of parent child and the and of course the attachment unit where that helps the child survive is where the child really sees and 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 takes in everything from birth from the minute of birth, and, and some of the research I use is uh, infant research, and I, and I describe even a little bit some of the infant research on the, on attachment and and the co construction of parents and babies from the second the baby is born, the the baby is responding to the mother's communication, nonverbal communication, of course, to to voice, to gaze, to facial expression to movement, to touch. And all of that is researched in an incredible way in, in infant research. One of the research I, I mentioned in the book is Beatrice Beebe's from Columbia University. And, the, and it's all these days done through video analysis of moment by moment analysis. So that is that is how we know, really. And that changed a lot of of the, our perception of what a baby is, what a baby can do, how much the baby actually is responsive versus what they used to think is autistic phase at the beginning, how much the baby influences and impacts the mother's mind, how much she impacts 
the babies, mind you know, I'm saying the mother because a lot of the, those researchers are with actually with, with mothers. There are a little bit of fathers, but a lot of them are done with mothers and babies. And so going back to how do we transmit emotions and trauma, you, we think about that unit, parent-child unit, and the way the child feels the parent in order to survive, by the way, right? I mean, we're talking about a survival uh, mechanism that that attachment and the child needs to know the parent. The, ch- the, the child needs to know everything about the parent. The child needs to know when the parent is afraid. The child needs to know when the parent is present. The child needs to engage the parent in order to take care of him, right? The baby. And that mechanism is where it starts. And of course, goes on and on later in life. But it starts with the way babies take in everything, even if they don't fully register it consciously, Mm. right? And that's when we are, right? In all of those stories, I mean... Tell me if you want me to give you one example of that, of how we can imagine, right, how that happens in specific stories. Yeah. And I'm, I think I'm like sort of caught in that the baby has to engage the mother. That mm-hmm. just like, it was like, oh, I yeah. mean, yeah, I always yeah. think about it from mother to baby, but, you know, the baby biologically mm-hmm. for survival does those, the smile yeah. and the way of gripping the finger and all of those, you know, and responding, you see that it's unbelievable in the moment, moment analysis, you see, right. They, they, they actually freeze it every moment and you can see the mother and, and the baby simultaneously and how there is, how responsive babies are to the mother's very, very subtle cues and facial expressions that without the the slow motion you you will never be able to see mm. right the video allows you to see the nuances of the responsiveness between parents and babies or mothers and babies in those researches and what you're saying is is fascinating because i think some part of what you see in those videos is how anxious i would say us mothers can be when the baby is not engaging us, and that happens when the baby becomes overstimulated or right, it needs to regulate. Mm-hmm. And one way to regulate, because eye contact, for example, is very is is very overstimulating. So the babies could do eye contact for a limited amount of time, and then they need to move their heads away. Uh, you see how mothers get really anxious because the baby move the head away. The more anxious the mother is, the more she's going to get and interrupt with that regulation process because she wants the baby to come back. So she'll come in and loom into the baby's face and it's like, almost like saying, baby, come back, come back. I need you. I don't want you to reject me. I don't want to feel like I'm a bad mom. I don't want to feel like you you went away. I need you, right? And when the baby moves the head away, the baby needs, the baby will always come back, right? The baby needs the mother, if you think about it. I think that's part of the way we talk to mothers to say like the baby really needs you. The baby cannot survive without you. So wait, the baby will come back. The baby will move her head away and she will come back. The more anxious the mother is, the more bad she, right? The more bad she feels about the baby, so to speak, rejecting her, the more she's going to in it, to come in and try to bring the baby back, the more distressed the baby is going to become and, and reject her even more, right? Because the baby will need to regulate more and more and more and become and become upset. And you see those things in the video. It's pretty, it's pretty incredible to see. And again, thinking about how that works, that early nonverbal communication, sophisticated levels of communication between parents and babies and what the babies are capable of doing when they are like out of the uterus, you know, just born. Yeah. It's incredible. And then you understand when you see that, you really understand that the baby actually sees everything, responds to everything. And so it brings us back to emotional inheritance in a sense that what babies, children, and and of course then grown ups, but in but in that order, take in is not only what we communicate with them and tell them, but also the gaps, also the body language around what is not comfortable, or everything that is not said, right? Yes. The omission. Yes. 
that's that. <laughs> right, right. And that, and that's so funny. That because you know that I quote in the book psychoanalyst Maria Tork and uh, Nicholas Abraham. They were Holocaust survivors, by the way, and uh, they wrote a lot about the transmission of uh, emotions. They, they, they wrote it in, in this, the late 60s and 70s. Uh, and what they wrote, the quote is that what haunts, what haunts us are not the dead, but the gaps left within us by the secrets of others. It's a very powerful quote, you know, this mm-hmm. very powerful. what they were talking about really is that the feeling of, right, that is left, all of those gaps, all of the things that we don't know, all of the ghosts that I call them in the book, those gaps that we feel, but we don't really know. We can't fully identify that. The ghost of the unsaid and the unspeakable. Yeah, that is so powerful. Just even hearing you say that. I mean, I'm, of course, I'm thinking about my own family. That's probably every time, again, consciously <laughs> or unconsciously. But, you know, thinking about like, for example, I'm thinking of one thing in my family that was basically a secret, the generation before me, that there was a secret for, okay, so if we do the grandparent, parent, present, child, me, mm-hmm. the, my grandmother, there was something she never told and she passed away. And so my mom, her only child learned something that was like so obvious, but never said explicitly. Mm -hmm. And, and my grandmother had also denied it, but after she passed away, it was like, my mom could actually know it. Mm. And did she ever confirm it? Like she knew it or it was a feeling that she actually allowed herself to know that that is true. That. Yeah. Yeah. And so just thinking about how, like, what was that like for my mom to live her whole life and get to be, you know, into her like late sixties with a sense of something Mm. that was never said. And even, even for her mom to die, you know, she asked her mom before she died directly and her mom said, no, that's not true, but we know it's true. So it's like, you know, just what yeah. the carrying of that. And then, you know, just that, that omission, that just feels so heavy. Yeah. yeah. And in your case, it's, it's not just a silenced omission. It's, it's the denial, denial. Right? which is even another, right? Because many, many times, and I think when people ask me, how, how do we, so how do we know about our, what our emotional inheritance is? Uh, and I think that one of the things is that when people read the book, the aha moment comes really quickly. It's exactly what that process that happened to you as we speak, right? Immediately as they read the stories, they're like, oh, actually, I never thought about that. You start making connections between yeah. things. And then you find that, A, many people actually never thought about their history. They never put together things or they even things they knew, right? They knew that something happened. And that these are reactions that I get on a daily basis, right? People say, huh, actually, I realized my father was sick when he was young. And, and now I figure it out and I put it together with how, how much I'm worried about my body and how, like, even simple things like that. Yeah. Right, that I never put together. Or my, you know, and in the book, there are many examples of that, but that that's, how when people read it, they start thinking and making connections. They also sometimes go and ask questions that they never asked. I think about the the example you gave is really like a very, very complicated one when you ask and get, and get the, the wrong, (laughs) the wrong answer, right? Like the denial. And, and in so many ways, in so many times, I think people don't ask because they know that the parent or grandparent will never confirm it because, and and in some ways we collude with our parents around their secrets because we don't want to expose them, right? Exactly. It's that like, you know, everyone's talking about that movie in Kanto and it has the, mm-hmm. the song, we don't talk about Bruno. You know, it's that we just all know we don't talk about we whatever the talk. thing is. Yeah. We don't talk about it in our family and we don't break that rule. Yeah. Like a code of silence. Yeah. It's the family code of silence. Exactly. We become the gatekeepers of the unspeakable ourselves. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And how hard it is to sit with, I mean, I'm talking about us because it's all of us, uh, therapists, patients, all of us. Right. But how hard it is a therapist to sit with that with patients 
who have that code and they are the gatekeepers and and who even wants to know <laughs> i mean many of us and our patients are like no 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 don't touch that this is not what i want to know exactly there's like that feeling of this isn't we can't yeah. go there yeah this is outside of of our comfort zone and outside of what we are allowed to know yeah so how do we how do we do that like how do we make the unknown known or how do we not collude with that i don't know if that's too complicated to ask you know i think that that's a question that is actually uh, it's a really good question because i believe that the minute we have that frame in mind as therapists for example we listen to that between the lines we don't go after i mean even when patients come you know to therapy with me I, it's not my main focus it's not like the minute somebody comes with a presented problem i'm like okay let's look <laughs> at your parents and grandparents and this is where the secret lies. Right? there is yeah. no right we don't discover this, the unknown secrets in a in a very obvious way but it's part of my frame. I, I listen to that. And I think that is true for all of us, not just therapists. The minute we have that framework, we're already, you know, if we think about therapists, I always say, you know, you already sit differently on, on your chair as a therapist. Yeah. It's, you have a different posture. And I think that you have a different posture in life as a person if you, if that is part of the way you think. If you if you understand that concept, you can't not see it anymore. You immediately. Yes. Right? And if you don't see it, it does mean that your defenses are really, really strong. And there is something there that you're afraid to touch. And those are the situations that where we just have to wait. Yes, exactly. Right? There's nothing we can do. It's like, you know, as a, as a therapist, when you tell somebody, give them an, an intervention or interpretation, and they and it's that's just obvious that this is not where they are and there is nothing you can do about it. You have to respect the unconscious. You have to respect people's defenses. There is a reason why they have defenses. We have defenses. Yes, yes, that's true. So there's a difference between avoiding something and respecting the role of the defense. Yeah, yeah. Or being like, I think, yeah, it's exactly what you're saying. Avoiding the role of the defense or or respecting the role of the defense versus the, the understanding that I hear from many people that they have never even knew that that's something we could, we could even think about. So the minute th they have this framework, they're like, oh, I, that makes sense. And that investigation starts, right? And it, it, it takes many, many layers of, of exploration. Yeah. So how do you want readers to use this book? You know, what, what will it help them to do? You know, I think that for me, I like this question because for me, the book is really a book of reflection and introspection. And I really hope that the book itself is, can become an emotional experience mm -hmm. that reading it becomes an emotional experience. It's not a, a typical self-help book that has exercise or that tells you how to do things. It is a book that takes you to an emotional journey. Mm -hmm. I want I want to believe. Right? It took me writing it to an emotional journey, you know. So really my my hope is that people can really people can really feel something when they read it and then and then connect that with thoughts, you know, and for me, the the most important is that is that integration of thoughts and feelings, right? And that like having an emotional experience, as we know, even even in therapy, mm -hmm. is is the beginning of of something. So yeah. that, that's that's really my main my main goal is for people to to feel something that will allow them to know something. Mm, I love that. Yes. Yeah, it sounds like helping people understand that there's more, more than meets the eye going on and to maybe awaken that way of thinking about their own story about their life and their, their family and their relationships. Yeah. And find them. I think that many people find themselves in almost every chapter, right? Mm -hmm. Because there are so many, so many little stories within every story that 
and, and thinking about ourselves and reflecting on who we are, uh, how our, who our parents are, what are right how, how do we how do we go through life? Uh, what do we need, right? What is our pain and many, many more questions. Yeah, well, I think this is so beautiful and I I love even on the front, I'm gonna just read what Bruce Perry said. He said, beautiful, artistic, elegant. I was like, oh, <laughs> I love Bruce Perry and getting an endorsement from Dr. Bruce Perry is very really special. Uh, very special. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, congratulations on this. And I know that many of the therapists listening will also be interested in your other books, but this, this book is beautiful and I'm so glad that you made it and thank had you. that journey yourself. Thank you so much. And really, thank you for inviting me. This was a fascinating conversation. <laughs> really. I loved well, it. Thank you. I was so happy to have you here today. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. So let's just tell real quick, will you tell our audience where they can find more about you and your work and buy your book? So Emotional Inheritance is in all bookstores and on Amazon, of course. Uh, it's, there is also an audiobook that I narrate Ooh, with, with my accent. Me and my accent came together to, uh, to narrate the book. <laughs> you without your accent wouldn't be you. <laughs> exactly. And so that was an amazing experience. Uh, so it's on the um, audiobook and hardcover and also um, ebook, ebook. Uh, so we have that. It's going to be translated to 17 different languages. Wow. So only, yeah, next month, a few in other countries and other languages. And uh, you can find, I think, most of the information on my uh, website, which is uh, www.galitatlas.com. And uh, you can find me on Instagram too. There's a lot of all the, a lot of the talks and the, uh, you know, the, the presentations and professional talks, but also talks for the public. I do both. Uh, I post them uh, on my Instagram page. So. And what's your Instagram? It's Galit, G-A-L-I-T underscore Atlas. But I, I have a feeling that there is no other, uh, somebody else with my name. It takes a lot of bit time for people to even remember my first name. So I feel like if you put Galit Atlas, you're probably going to get to me. <laughs> no. Or the other Galit Atlas who's out there talking about saying, whatever. <laughs> no, I know. Probably not. <laughs> I don't know. I didn't meet her yet, but if she exists, I would love to meet her. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll put a link to that too in the show notes. And Galit, thank you again so much for being my guest today. Thank you, Laura. Thank you so much. Thank you to Therapy Notes for sponsoring this week's episode. I do love Therapy Notes. It's such an asset to my business and makes my job as a practice owner and a therapist much easier. Try it today with no strings attached and see why everyone is switching to Therapy Notes, now featuring ePrescribe. Use coupon code CHAT or click the link in the show notes to get two free months at therapynotes.com. Thank you to The Receptionist for iPad for sponsoring this week's episode. The Receptionist for iPad is the highest rated digital check-in software for therapy offices and behavioral health clinics used by thousands of practitioners across the country. The Receptionist for iPad is a simple, inexpensive way to allow your clients to discreetly check in, to notify providers of a patient's arrival, and to ensure your front lobby is stress-free. Start a 14-day free trial of The Receptionist for iPad by going to thereceptionist.com slash therapy chat. And when you do, you'll also get your first month free when you sign up. Thank you for listening to Therapy Chat with your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. For more information, please visit therapychatpodcast.com. 